Our next speaker is Barry Kramer from the uh, Division of Cancer Prevention and NCI, where he's the director. He's um, helped lead two large cancer screening trials and is a real thought leader on how to balance issues related to screening and a very important topic of actually screening and finding more lethal cancers as opposed to more indolent cancers. Thank you. First, I want to thank Ed and Nancy and Tyler for uh, giving me the honor of the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I got instructions from two people about this talk, two people that are higher on the food chain than I am, so I better um, tell you who they were. Tyler called me a couple of days ago and said, uh, don't give a cynical talk. Um, and I take that to heart because Doug Lowy has told me that periodically as well. Um, and the other instruction um, I got is from Doug Lowy, and that is to be sure to mention that aspirin has been shown to decrease the risk of getting colorectal cancer and decrease the risk of dying of colorectal cancer. It has harms, as we know, but now we have a new tool that can be superimposed on the efficacy of screening. And so we're developing tools uh, in parallel and continue to do research. But I, I hope that you will walk out of the room not as cynics, but as healthy skeptics in every sense of uh, that phrase. Because screening as currently practiced, using the tools that we currently have, is a double-edged tool. And depending on the disease, depending on the screening test, and depending on the frequency, and depending on the targeted person, um, one edge of that sword can be sharper than the other. And that's why we have to do studies. It's important to do often randomized control trials to establish whether there is a net benefit. So I'm going to start off with the benefits so that you don't think that um, all is lost. Using currently available screening tests, we can be very confident that screening will reduce the risk of dying of several cancers. The most notable one is cervical cancer. It's probably the biggest effect. It was probably the biggest game changer in cancer around the world. Um, unfortunately, most of the world currently can't um, afford to launch programs and sustain them, so we need research, additional research on, of course, vaccines and cheaper ways, more efficient ways to uh, treat women who don't have access. But that is, was so effective as a screening test, the pap smear, uh, and now HPV testing, that we didn't need randomized controlled trials. You only need a randomized controlled trial when you're looking for incremental benefits, but this was so large that we could accept uh, the benefit without uh, launching a randomized trial. All the others that I'm going to talk about required randomized controlled trials because it was a much closer call. Uh, the harms were often larger, and the benefits considerably smaller. But we are confident that um, if you have a high enough risk population of smokers and former smokers, that low-dose CT scanning decreases the risk of dying of lung cancer. If you screen about 1,000 people over a period of seven years and follow them for seven years, there'll be three fewer deaths from lung cancer, three deaths out of 1,000. Uh, colorectal cancer, about two out of 1,000 if you screen them for about a decade and superimpose on that, as I mentioned, um, hopefully is aspirin. Breast cancer um, from randomized trials, we can say that you'll, if you screen about 1,000 women over about 12 or 13 years, then you'll uh, reduce the risk of death by about 0 0.5 to 1 women, depending um, on their age. And, so it's, and, and I have to point out that's in the pre-screening era. Um, therapy has gotten much more effective since those results were available to us. And as therapy gets better and better and better, the need for uh, screening is not as, um, as urgent. Now, on the other side of the coin, and so it's a little bit of like a lottery, by the way. So everybody pays into the lottery. You screen 1,000 people, 2,000 people over a decade or so. And uh, there are lottery winners, but 
everyone has to pay some of the costs and sometimes the harms that can be spread out over the people who um, uh, would not benefit and couldn't even benefit in theory because they were not ever going to get the disease in the first place. And the other edge of this sword, which can be sharp, is if our focus is solely on sensitivity, we have to be careful. Sensitivity, that is the ability to pick up smaller and smaller and smaller tumors. We have to be careful to figure out which, what are, what's the underlying biology of those smaller and smaller tumors, because there are many tumors that you would die with but never of, and so it does you no good to pick them up. It only uh, causes harm, and that's a phenomenon cause that's known as overdiagnosis that I'll get into. Um, then there's a series of cancers for which we have little or no evidence that there's a net benefit with current tools. Ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, skin melanoma, thyroid cancer, cancer of the oral cavity, brain cancer. We you read periodically people drive around the countryside with these brain scanners, and you can imagine how high the stakes are if you pick up something in the brain and you have to go after it invasively, and a neuroblastoma of childhood. But even for these tumors, a large proportion of the public and the professions, by the way, believe that they are beneficial and this is due to a very strong intuition, which is uh, the nature of my talk today, and hence the title. First, uh, my disclosures. I have no financial relationships to disclose. And um, the opinions you'll hear are mine and not official positions of uh, the US federal government, another point that Doug Lowy reminds me of sometimes. So. Uh, um, Cancer screening was not always a passion in our nation. Uh, I'll take you back to the dawn of enthusiasm, which caught on when Dr. Bloodgood of Johns Hopkins announced that he had a way to virtually eliminate all cancers. And this was nothing more than simple screening. That is, be vigilant, be careful, ask patients about subtle symptoms, and do a careful physical examination. And he thought that was the secret to practically eliminating um, all deaths from cancer. Now, a lot of time has gone by since he made that declaration in 1924. So we know that he was off the mark. So even though he was able to pick up cancers Earlier, it wasn't early enough because it made little or no impact, uh, not with the tools he was talking about in reducing uh, the risk of dying of the target conditions. That enthusiasm has persisted. Um, this is the, an ad for the, uh, the Genius 3D mammography tomosynthesis. And again, it basically says that Using this tool, we may be able to take the mortality rate from breast cancer from 40,000 women per year down to zero. In other words, here we are more than three quarters of a century later with the same level of enthusiasm that Dr. Bloodgood had. And as a matter of fact, there have been ads in the past that basically intimated that it, if you didn't have a mammogram, then you needed something more than your breast exam. And you were actually, um, you, know, you were crazy. Um, and so that's pretty extreme, and nevertheless, we have to learn that it is double-edged, and it is often, if not always, a close call, and that's why we talk about informed consent, about the benefits, if they have been proven, and uh, how do they balance against the harms. And here's another much more recent ad about a girl who clearly has a, a um, <clears throat> adolescent who clearly has her priorities wrong. She is thinking about the cute upperclassmen in school when what she should really be focusing on is getting screened for thyroid cancer. So I want to point out that uh, there are core issues in screening and in prevention. The first is that it is difficult to make healthy people better off than they already are. Most of the target population are healthy people. Unfortunately, it is sometimes easy to make healthy people worse off than they already are. So we need a high level of evidence before we make blanket guidelines and recommendations. And, and often, we need to resort to long, expensive, randomized controlled trials to develop that evidence because the balance of risks and benefits is sometimes closer than we like to intuit. And there's another issue of ethics of screening. It is not like the run-of-the-mill medical oncology when a patient comes to you suffering from their cancer. They don't necessarily 
want you to be quite so persnickety about the evidence. Um, they want you to take your best guess and treat them, try to relieve their suffering. That's not the case with screening. Screening the person is healthy. The messages have to go in the other direction, and there's a certain obligation to the health professional community when you're trying to push screening to healthy people. You have to be quite confident that there is a net benefit, and sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, and sometimes it's a very, very close call that the person should know about. So that's why we need to protect ourselves from very powerful intu intuitions that um, early detection is often early enough. We're always early enough, and there's always a, a net benefit. We have to look at both sides of that very sharp instrument. We have to remember we're starting on the left-hand side of the slide with a healthy population in most cases, or an asymptomatic population. Um, and the ultimate goal are health outcomes. That is, how does the patient feel or function? That is, cancer mortality or overall mortality or quality of life. We often don't improve quality of life because some of the therapies and interventions we have can actually um, diminish some aspects of quality of life. We also have to remember that there are intermediate endpoints, but there are not valid surrogates. So early cancer detection may not be anywhere close to early enough. The ability to do surgery is also too crude. Just because you can do more surgeries than you could in the past doesn't mean that you have improved the health outcomes. And you also have to um, look at the trade-offs for um, the adverse effects of screening itself, things like perforations, on and on, um, and adverse effects of treatment. And then finally, we're fi we have to come to grips with this in our country now, and that is uh, societal outcomes and trade-offs, um, because it is certainly possible that you can divert resources from an intervention in the healthcare system that works a lot to things that work a little or not at all. And so even if you restrict it to things that work a little, you could diminish the health of the community. And at great cost, we have to look, with, look at what the trade-offs are. It, it, there was a time in our country when we could say that um, the two questions, does it work and should we do it, were one and the same question. Other countries with organized healthcare systems know that they are two separate questions, and I think we have finally gotten to the point where we have to recognize that they are two separate questions. And this is a case in point. Um, we spend, we're starting to spend some serious dollars in the healthcare system, $2.9 trillion a year. That's in excess of $9,000 per capita, which is more than 40% higher than the next highest per capita spender. And what do we get in return? Life expectancy. We rank 50th among 221 nations, and we rank 27th among 34 industrialized um, nations in the OECED. And so we have to get a little bit smarter about where we're going to put our um, resources. And an expensive um, expenditure turns out to be screening, because you have to screen um, large swaths of the large population. Now, the WHO, which um, looks at organized screening programs, came, came up with over uh, about a dozen uh, criteria that they would recommend fulfilling before implementation of a widespread screening program. And they are all listed here. It's a long, it's a very high bar, as you can see. Um, I have highlighted some of the things in red, like available suitable tests with agreed upon cutoff values knowledge about the natural history of what you're actually detecting, um, a test that preferentially detects lesions likely to progress, and on and on. The reason why I have listed those bullets in red is those are bullets that are not known to be true for prostate cancer screening or are known not to be true for prostate cancer screening. And yet, prostate cancer screening caught on with a vengeance, and it is very difficult to, to reverse gears. Short of a randomized trial, we are often subject, subject uh, not only to our own strong intuitions, which are very seductive, but to three important biases, selection bias, lead time bias, and length biased sampling. Selection bias occurs because not all people who are offered screening or who could be screened or who are eligible for screening 
get screened. There's a very strong selection process. And it is called healthy screenee bias, healthy volunteer bias, and so forth. So the people that get screened can be fundamentally different from the people who don't get screened. They tend to be wealthy, white, um, pay attention to many other healthcare messages, and have access to the healthcare system. They're insured. And so they're going to do well no matter what, irrespective of whether or not they actually get the screening test. And here a case is important. We had the opportunity to look at this healthy volunteer effect in the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer trial, which was a randomized control trial, which showed some screening tests have a net benefit, i.e. sigmoidoscopy. Um, and some tests had no net benefit, like chest x-ray in both smokers and non-smokers, and ovarian cancer screening um, with the usual tools that we have available to us with CA-129 and uh, well, CA-125 and uh, ultrasound. But we had the opportunity to look at the people who were interested enough in screening to sign up for the trial and be randomized compared to the underlying health and characteristics of people in the general population of National Health Survey. And you can see that we had a lower rate of smokers in the PLCO. So you already know that these people have a lower risk of dying of a whole variety of cancers and a lower risk of dying, period. Regular physical activity, better in the PLCO trial. Um, a more educated group in the PLCO and um, less comorbidity. And that translated into outcomes so that when we looked at the standardized mortality ratio in the PLCO participants compared to what was expected, this is observed divided by expected, you can see that in virtually every case, and in every case on this slide, there were far fewer deaths um, from a whole variety of diseases than would have been expected in the target population in the country. And the one that amuses me the most is uh, down the list. There was about a 40 per 35 to 40 percent reduction in death from injuries and poisoning in the PLCO. And we did nothing to try to decrease car injuries or poisonings. And so obviously, this was uh, a much healthier population than you would expect. And we found the same thing in the National Lung Screening Trial, where the uh, overall survival rates were much better in the people who signed up, even though that these were heavy smokers and former smokers, much lower risk of dying than any outside population that we could concoct at the national um, level through uh, national surveys. And, um, and so um, part of the benefit of screening appears to be just underlying health, wealth, and so forth, and, and uh, other issues. Um, and that's why randomized trials are so important. It's almost impossible to construct an appropriate control group if it's not an internal and randomized control group when you're looking for um, benefits of the magnitude I talk about, talked about three per thousand, two per thousand, one or a half per thousand. It also brings up the point that you need to know what the harms are and compare the harms to not screening because three per thousand uh, is an important public health, important breakthrough, I would say, for lung cancer screening. But it shows you that you don't have too much wiggle room. So if the surgery isn't done in a very experienced setting, if the radiologists aren't giving you the very best readings, if people are getting treated that have a few extra comorbidities um, than were in this trial, then it's not hard to see how that three could be diminished or even go away. And that's why we need to make sure that the process is optimized, not just the single test. Um, the next bias is lead time bias, where there's a guaranteed survival time for people who are screened. You set the clock earlier when you pick up any cancer um, in an asymptomatic stage. And even if the, the person goes on to, to die of the very same cancer on the very same day, their survival rate looks better. That's why you can't um, look to survival for progress when a new screening test comes on board. It's analogous to being tied down on the railroad tracks and no way of getting up. And the 5 o'clock train comes through. And when it uh, comes through, it, it's going to end your life. And so now we develop um, a more sensitive screening test. We'll call it binoculars. And so we can 
make the diagnosis of train much earlier, but it doesn't, take, uh, it doesn't change the instant of impact. And so we got to be careful that when we develop early uh, detection tools, it's earlier in the same sense um, that you heard from Bert Vogelstein's talk. I'm, I'm sure he would agree. It's not enough just to set the clock earlier. You've got to pick up um, the lesions that would go on, and you can change the natural history. Length bias sampling occurs for virtually every common screening test. And that is, even though we want to pick up the life-threatening cancers and miss the slow-growing cancers, we're better at picking up slow-growing cancers than the rapidly-growing cancers. And as that's shown on this cartoon here. If you have a screen test that goes to the population here, there are two subpopulations of people with cancers, those with the short arrows, rapidly growing cancers, and those with very long arrows, slow, slower growing cancers, you can see that you can enrich the number of diagnoses with the slowest growing cancers. So you're comparing two different biologies, and we now know that, as a matter of fact, at the molecular level in some cases, like neuroblastoma and breast cancer, that the screening tests pick up a somewhat different spectrum of behavior, and it tends to be less aggressive cancers. And so you can't compare it to external controls. And um, then the extreme form of these two biases is, is overdiagnosis. Um, overdiagnosis occurs because of the heterogeneity of cancer progression. And um, a screening tests can pick up different um, aggressiveness, uh, levels of aggressiveness of tumors. So everyone, we, this is oversimplifying cancer, that it starts as one aberrant cell. That's not true. But for the purposes of this slide, uh, it, it makes the point. And then the cancer grows and grows and grows until the time it causes uh, symptoms. But of course, we're all involved in a horse race. Um, the cancer, if it continues to grow and you can't stop it, causes death. But we can die from other causes at the same time. Uh, uh, at, not at the same time. We can die of other causes of, of um, death. And um, if you were not destined to die of your cancer, then early detection doesn't do you any good. If you have a very fast-growing cancer, then it is the cancer that is going to win that horse race and cause death. If it's a little bit slower, then still the cancer can cause death if you don't intervene. But there are cancers that grow so slowly that you would never know about them before they reach the point of causing symptoms by the time you die of other natural causes. And even those that are either totally non-progressive or even, we are learning, uh, completely regress. And as I've said before, screening tests are better at picking up those, those last two categories, and the slower growing cancers. And when a screening test does that, it is overdiagnosis. And it leads to. Uh, therapy that has, couldn't have any efficacy, only harm. And this is what overdiagnosis looks like at the population level. What happens is the incidence goes up with increased awareness or increased use of the screening test, but death rates remain relatively stable. And so you can see in all those cases on that slide, thyroid, prostate cancer, and so forth, that the mortality rate has been about stable, but the incidence rate has skyrocketed as um, we developed awareness programs or screening. You can see what would happen here. The survival rate would go up. Five-year survival rate goes up. 10-year survival rate goes up. 15-year survival rate goes up. Cure rate goes up. Because to the extent that there is overdiagnosis, you are curing people that didn't need to be cured in the first place. Um, but nevertheless, randomized trials have shown us that there are tests commonly available that overcome the problem of overdiagnosis. And by the way, overdiagnosis is not a big problem in colorectal cancer screening. Colorectal cancer screening tests decrease incidence. They don't increase them. Why is that? Well, they pick up cancers early enough. They pick up polyps. And you're removing the um, precursor lesion. But we always have to be cognizant of the adverse effects of screening as well. And this is why there is a raging debate over mammography in women. Should they start at 40? Should they stay, start at 50? Nobody, I, I think, knows with confidence the absolute right answer. All we do know is that the benefits increase with age. Um, and the, uh, the harms decrease with age, as you can see on this slide. There's a lot fewer false positives and so forth. Um, also, it has been said in the past that even if mammography 
didn't decrease the risk of dying of breast cancer, it would spare women their breasts. And at least as far as we know, again, from randomized trials, that's not the case. Even though a smaller proportion of women go on to mastectomy in the randomized trials, a larger number of women in the mammography arms went on to mastectomy because there was more diagnosis. And so a smaller proportion of a larger number still led to a larger number of mastectomies. In the case of prostate cancer, there's a downside to act active surveillance is an important intervention now because we now know that um, many men who are screen detected for prostate cancer should not, it's not in their interest to be treated. There's more harm in treating them because they were destined to die with prostate cancer, not die of prostate cancer. Yet active surveillance has its own harms. And that is, a, this is an experience from Ontario, but it is almost identical to the experience in our own Medicare population. That is, even though the rate of prostate biopsy was relatively stable in Ontario, um, admissions to the emergency department of hospitals went up over time after um, a biopsy of the prostate. Why is that? Well, you're going through the rectum, which is inherently a little bit of a dirty area. Um, and you can introduce bacteria, and in, not only into the prostate, but into the bloodstream. And these are very, very dangerous organisms. Um, and, and it's getting worse because uh, we're running out of our armamentarium to screen these people. Also, false positives are a harm to patient. The PLCO showed um, rates of 50% and higher. And, and unemployment is a big problem. This is a serious issue. People get underemployed after diagnosis or unemployed, depending on the cancer. This is the wrong time to become underemployed because you use, lose your ability to pay. So I'm going to finish up and say there are two very good consequences of screening. Reduce risk of death from the target cancer. You know, nearly always need a randomized trial. Reassurance, assuming that healthy people need to be reassured. But there are um, bad consequences. False reassurance, false alarms when you don't have the cancer, harms of the test itself, detection of a lethal cancer without changing the outcome, and so you just live longer as a cancer patient, and then a detection of non-lethal cancers and overdiagnosis. Sir Muir Gray summarized it by saying all screening programs do harm. Some do good as well, and of these, some do more good than harm at a reasonable cost. And he summarized everything that I've said. And I'll leave you with this cartoon from the far side. And that is, once you shoot, you can't ask questions anymore. And sometimes we tend to do that. We shot with prostate cancer screening, and everybody started getting screening, and it became a bear to try to answer the question with everybody getting screened and the contamination that was going on. And I'll stop with that.